In 1983, when you wanted to get software for your computer, you had to go to a store and buy it on a floppy disk. Or maybe you could download it over a telephone line very slowly. But if you had a Naboo PC, you could get new software in a few seconds from the comfort of your own home. The Naboo came with a cable modem that could download applications directly from the Naboo network over your cable television service. The Naboo network was an amazing technical achievement, but it never caught on. By 1985, Naboo went out of business and the Naboo network went dark. I have one of these now useless cable modems. Let's take it apart and see how it works. And then let's try to recreate the cable signal so that we can bring this modem back to life. First, let's look at the outside of the cable modem, which Naboo called the network adapter. It has some status indicators on the front, and on the back, there are connections for the Naboo PC and the cable network. This box on the back is interesting. It's where the cable network connects. Let's start by taking it off and seeing what it does. Looking through the holes, I can see lots of capacitors and inductors, so this is almost certainly a filter. I hooked it up to a signal generator that was sweeping across frequencies from 0 to 1 gigahertz. I watched the output of the box with a spectrum analyzer. The box only allowed frequencies between approximately 260 and 280 megahertz to pass through it. Here's a block diagram of what we've learned so far. I'll keep updating it as we go. For now, we just have the cable input going into the filter box on the back of the network adapter. Now let's get inside and have a look. There's three sections, the power supply, a logic board, and a metal box. The metal box is where the signals from the cable network get processed. I want to focus on that first. I untwisted all the locking tabs and pulled off the lid. That revealed six compartments. Two compartments are soldered shut. The other four compartments have circuit boards in them. The components are mostly on the opposite side. I took some pictures for later and put the lid back on. On the other side of the metal box, the four compartments have press fit lids that were easy to pull off revealing the components inside. In the compartment closest to the cable input, we find a frequency synthesizer chip, a frequency prescaler chip, and a crystal. It's hard to see, but there are signals labeled on the circuit board, clock, data, and enable. Those signals come from the frequency synthesizer chip and are connected to terminals that leave the metal box and connect to the logic board. This tells us there's an oscillator in this compartment and its frequency is controlled by the logic board. There's a wire labeled IF filter. IF is short for intermediate frequency. The wire goes into the first of the soldered shut compartments. Considering all this evidence, this looks like the first stage of a cable TV receiver, which should really be no surprise. Here's my best guess for the block diagram so far. The box on the outside of the network adapter, the one we tested earlier, is a bandpass filter. Everything else in this drawing is inside the first compartment. The purpose is to move a desired signal, in this case the Naboo network signal, from its original frequency to an intermediate frequency to make later filtering and processing stages simpler. This is accomplished by mixing the input signals with a local oscillator that determines the amount of the frequency shift. How can we tell what is the frequency of the local oscillator? One way is to use an RF probe to look for a strong signal emanating from this compartment. Virtually all electronics leak some amount of their signal energy as electromagnetic fields. As I moved the probe around, I quickly found a very strong 324 MHz signal. This is almost certainly the local oscillator. Another way is to listen in on how the logic board is configuring the frequency synthesizer, which is controlling the frequency of the local oscillator. The configuration is sent serially, or one bit at a time, into a shift register inside the frequency synthesizer chip. I set my oscilloscope to listen to the clock, data, and enable signals. Decoding the signals and matching them up with the data sheet, we can tell that the frequency synthesizer's in divisor is set to 324. The R divisor is controlled by three pins on the frequency synthesizer, and they're hardwired on the circuit board. I used a voltmeter to see how they were wired and looked up the corresponding R divisor, which is 512. We now know the divisors for both arms of the frequency synthesizer. We know the frequency of the top arm is determined by the crystal, which is 8 MHz. With this information, we can calculate the frequency of this arm at the phase detector. 
8 megahertz divided by 512 is 15.625 kilohertz. The phase detector's job is to adjust the local oscillator so that the two frequencies entering the phase detector are the same. So when the local oscillator's frequency is correctly adjusted, the frequency on the bottom arm of the phase detector will also be 15.625 kilohertz. To find the local oscillator frequency, we just multiply our way back through the dividers in the bottom arm. Multiplying 15.625 kilohertz back through the end divider by 324 gives us 5.0625 megahertz. But the divide by 64 frequency prescalar chip is between the local oscillator and the end divider, so we need to multiply by 64 to get the actual local oscillator frequency. That gets us to 324 megahertz, which matches what we picked up with the RF probe earlier. Here's the updated block diagram with all the things we've learned about the local oscillator. All that math was fun, but we still don't know with much precision what frequency range the network adapter is listening to. Our first clue is the external box, which we discovered filters out everything outside 260 to 280 megahertz. So it has to be in that region. Maybe the LED indicators on the front panel will tell us something. The way the cable LED is described in the user's guide makes it sound promising. I hooked up the signal generator again and swept through the frequencies from 260 to 280 megahertz to see what would happen with the LEDs. And sure enough, the cable light turns on between about 265 and 270 megahertz. I switched the signal generator to manual tuning, looking for the exact edges of the frequency range where the cable LED turns on or off. The LED turns on in the range of 264 to 270 megahertz exactly. Since the network adapter is designed to work over a cable TV system, I thought it would be a good idea to check if this frequency range is associated with a cable TV channel. And it is. 264 to 270 megahertz is the exact frequency range for cable TV channel 31. Let's add that bit of information to the block diagram. Now that we know what our input frequency range should be and what our local oscillator frequency is, we can figure out what the intermediate frequency is, the frequency coming out of the mixer in the first compartment and being allowed through by the filters in compartments two and three. The output of a mixer is the sum and difference of the local oscillator frequency and the input frequency. The input frequency is in the range of 264 to 270 megahertz. The local oscillator is 324 megahertz. Doing the math, that means two copies of the input frequency range will come out of the mixer at 54 to 60 MHz and 588 to 594 MHz. I think it's safe to assume they're using the lower range, 54 to 60 MHz, and filtering out the higher range as it makes the intermediate filter design easier. I was able to confirm this with a spectrum analyzer. Now let's look at compartment 4. There are two chips containing NPN transistor arrays. Each contains five transistors, nothing more. And there's another op-amp chip. There's a single terminal that leaves the compartment and connects to the logic board. On the back side, there's a pair of wires that come from the previous filter stage and another pair that goes to the next stage. I poked around with the oscilloscope and RF probe and didn't find any interesting signals. There's virtually no inductors or big capacitors, which suggests there's not much filtering going on here. I'm getting a strong feeling that this is an amplification stage. Let's look at the one terminal going to the logic board. If my assumption is correct, and this is a gain stage, then this terminal might do something interesting when I connect the signal generator and vary the level of the input signal. Starting with the signal generator off, the terminal is about 15.9 volts. When I turn the signal generator on, but set it to very low power, minus 100 dBm, it's still 15.9 volts. But when I get to negative 72 dBm, it drops to 13.8 volts. The voltage continues to decrease as the power increases until I get to 1.8 volts at minus 45 dBm. So the voltage on this terminal is some sort of input signal strength indicator, and the logic board makes use of it somehow. Back to the bottom of the circuit board. Let's take a look at the output signal as we vary the input power. When I turn on the signal generator at a very low power, we can see a weak sine wave. As I increase the power, the signal gets a bit stronger, but above minus 70 dBm, it stays at a nearly constant amplitude. As I go above minus 45 dBm, the signal starts to grow again and quickly distorts. 
So yeah, this compartment is definitely an automatic gain stage. And the ideal input power is between minus 70 and minus 45 dBm. On to compartment five. There's another one of those NPN transistor array chips and another op amp chip. There's a 14.2470 megahertz crystal. There's a label for an IF input signal, presumably from the previous stage. And there are two data out signals. There's a suspicious collection of eight diodes and there's this odd face-to-face -face arrangement of components that look like transistors, but are labeled CR, which suggests they're diodes, or transistors being used as diodes. We saw something similar back in compartment one, but I'm not entirely sure what they're doing here. On the back side, there's not much to learn. There are no signal traces on the bottom, just power and ground. We see a pair of wires coming from the previous compartment connecting to the IF input, and there's two capacitors connecting the two data out signals to the next compartment. I soldered on some extension wires to the IF input and two data out signals and put them up on the oscilloscope. I connected the signal generator to the cable input and set it for 267 megahertz, right in the middle of cable TV channel 31. The oscilloscope shows that the signal at the IF input is about 57 megahertz, which is our guess for the intermediate frequency coming from the mixer in the first compartment. So everything checks out so far. However, the data out signals are static. They're not changing or oscillating at all. To get the data out signals to change, I need to tune up to 267.049 megahertz. Zooming out, we can see the activity is in the form of two sinusoidal waves. To get the signal activity to stop again, I need to tune down to 267.037. On the low side, I need to tune down to 266.973 to see data out activity, and back up to 266.983 to make it stop. There seems to be some kind of frequency lock-in occurring here. Let's watch how the two data out traces, the yellow and cyan, behave when we tune in larger steps. Starting from 267 megahertz, we step down 100 kilohertz to 266.9 megahertz and we can see two nice sinusoidal waveforms at a frequency of around 100 kilohertz. The yellow sine wave leads the cyan by 90 degrees, or a quarter of a cycle. As we decrease the input frequency more, the frequency of the yellow and cyan signals increases proportionally, but the yellow is always 90 degrees ahead of the cyan. Back to 267 megahertz, if we step up 100 kilohertz to 267.1 megahertz, we can see the two sinusoids again at 100 kilohertz, but this time it's the cyan wave that leads the yellow wave. And again, as we get further from the center frequency of 267 megahertz, we see the data out frequency increase proportionally. From this behavior, we can be certain that this is a quadrature demodulator. It transforms the input signal into two output signals. As the input signal gets further from its center frequency, about 57 megahertz, the output frequencies increase proportionally. By producing two output signals, the quadrature demodulator can represent both frequencies below and above the input center frequency by having one of the output signals lead or lag the other by 90 degrees. This is a critical concept in software-defined radio, but it's a bit difficult to get your head around. It's definitely too large of a topic to cover completely in this video, so I hope you'll excuse a little hand-waving for now. Recall from a moment ago that there was a range of frequencies where there was no output from the quadrature demodulator. The two data out signals were static, showing no activity. That range was from 266.973 to 267.049, or 17 kilohertz below and 49 kilohertz above 267 megahertz. This suggests to me that maybe 267 megahertz isn't quite the right center frequency. Taking the average of those two frequencies, I get 267.011 megahertz. It's at this point I'd like to ask a rhetorical question. Hey, what is that 14.2470 megahertz crystal doing? I'd like to observe that the crystal's frequency is almost one quarter the intermediate frequency we'd estimated earlier, 57 megahertz. But that almost could be significant. 14.2470 times 4 is 56.9880 megahertz, which is 12 kilohertz below 57 megahertz. 
and the average frequency I just calculated is 267.011 megahertz, or 11 kilohertz above 267 megahertz. That's remarkably close, too close to be a coincidence. Remember the equations for calculating the output frequencies of a mixer? The mixer output frequencies are the local oscillator frequency plus and minus the input frequency. We know the local oscillator is 324 megahertz, and we had assumed that the input center frequency is 267 megahertz, so the math told us 57 megahertz would be one of the mixer output frequencies. But because of the frequency of the crystal in this compartment, maybe the mixer output frequency needs to be 56.9880, not 57 megahertz exactly. If we run the mixer math backwards, 324 minus 56.9880 equals 267.012 megahertz. That's almost exactly the same as the 267.011 megahertz average frequency for when there's no data out activity. So I think the true center frequency of the cable signal should be 267.012 megahertz. Okay, on to the sixth and last compartment. It's mostly digital logic chips in here. There's two exclusive OR chips, two flip-flop chips, and a NAND chip. There's also two comparator chips, and there's a 3.1555 megahertz crystal. There's also a couple of pads marked X, which match up on the backside of this board, where the two bridge capacitors are coming from the previous compartment, the quadrature demodulator. The circuit board has labels for data and clock signals, and those signals leave the compartment via posts that are wired to the logic board. This is where the demodulated data must come out, so this has to be the data demodulator. I'd like to point out that the NABU user's guide tells us a few very helpful things about the NABU network's modulation. The modulation method is OQPSK, which stands for Offset Quadrature Phase Shift Keying. The data rate is 6.312 megabits a second. Remember that 3.1555 megahertz crystal in this compartment? What is two times 3.1555? 6.311. And that, give or take a rounding or documentation error, is the same as the data rate of 6.312 megabits a second. So that crystal must be involved in synchronizing the modulated data. I hooked up my signal generator again and fed in different frequencies around 267 megahertz to see what data came out of the demodulator. At several frequencies, the clock signal settled into a somewhat regular pattern, though the data still looked random and noisy. I couldn't really draw any conclusions. Since I have no idea how one would make an OQPSK demodulator out of logic chips, but really wanted to, I decided I'd go straight to reverse engineering the circuit. I took photos of both sides of the board, which thankfully didn't have any internal circuit layers, and brought them into a paint program on my tablet. I then traced out the circuit board and documented the components and interconnections in a schematic capture program called KiCad. I completed enough of the schematic to get a decent picture of how the demodulator works. The two data out signals from the quadrature demodulator go into comparators, which quantize those analog signals into binary zeros and ones. Those bits go into two identical circuits. Each circuit samples the incoming bit once per clock period. Then another flip-flop delays that bit by one clock period. There's an exclusive OR that looks at the sampled and delayed bits and outputs a 1 if the bits are different, or in other words, if the value has changed in the last clock period. So the core of the demodulator is two of these circuits, which detect when an analog signal has changed polarity between negative and positive since the last clock period. In other words, they are differential decoders. The differential decoder for each of the two quadrature channels is clocked 180 degrees out of phase because of this inverter between the two decoder channels. This is a requirement for the offset part of the OQPSK modulation scheme. The data carried by each of the two quadrature channels is sent alternately so as to improve the signal characteristics over the QPSK modulation scheme that OQPSK derives from. The bits coming out of the differential decoders are multiplexed by a clock signal. During one half of the clock cycle, one channel is output, and the other half, the other channel is output. This re-interleaves the decoded data from each channel into a single data stream. 
I think we have this metal box reverse engineered enough that we can start experimenting with making our own cable signal. I'm going to use a software defined radio and the GNU radio software to produce a signal that will result in predictable bits coming out of the demodulator. So if that sounds interesting to you, please consider subscribing so you'll get notified when I upload a new video.